Welcome to this overview of 3D painting in Modo 601. Before we get started, I'd like you to just check a couple of preferences. So if you go to System Preferences, the first thing you'll see is there's a new Images and Painting section. And in here, just make sure that Threaded Painting is on. That means that you'll be able to use multiple cores for painting and it will make things a lot faster. Then, if you go to the OpenGL section, where it says Texture Resolution, Make sure it's set to something sensible. It defaults to 64 pixels by 64 pixels. This is only a display property, but it means that if you're painting on a 4K map, you're only going to see a very low resolution uh, version of it. So if you're going to be painting at 4K like I am in this tutorial, set it to 4K. If you've got a really beefy graphics card with a lot of RAM, you could probably set it higher and that would be fine. Um, a quick tip if you want to quickly get to the relevant texture for painting. Um, if in item mode you select the mesh you want to paint and then you right click on it, you can go down to shaders and then that will give you a little overview of the shader tree and uh, everything connected to that mesh. So just uh, quickly highlight the image you want and then you can see in the shader tree here it's ready for painting. So now I'm going to talk about the actual painting tools. The main two tools are the airbrush and the paintbrush. Um, to be really honest, there's very little difference between the two, but I'm just going to demonstrate it. If I right click to drag out um, the size I want to the brush, and I'll draw a stroke with the airbrush, and then I'll switch to the paintbrush and draw a stroke next to it. Basically, the paintbrush is very slightly denser. If I change to a harder tip and uh, draw out a stroke first with the paintbrush and then the airbrush, again, it takes a little bit longer for the airbrush to build up to the same kind of stroke density as the paintbrush, um, but really the difference is very, very subtle. Um, if you ever want to clear a texture back to the last saved state, um, if you go here into the Images tab and right click and click Reload, you can um, clear the work you've just done. You'll see me do this quite a lot, I think. Since the airbrush and the paintbrush are so similar, the way that you control the appearance of your strokes is through these tips down here. So the default tip is this soft airbrush one. I'll just right click on the canvas, make sure my colour is set to black. If I start painting on the mesh, you can see the effect pretty much what you expect. It's, a, it's an airbrush. Now if I change to the hard round tip, you get more of a brush or a marker. And then next to that, you've got the procedural brush. And this will paint with a noise texture or a cellular texture. And this is really useful for creating textures. Now let me just uh, reload the canvas. And uh, next to that, you've got the image brush. Now this requires that you load an image and uh, let me just resize that because it will default to the image's original size and if I set the color to white you can see what happens it will use the actual image as a brush but if I change the color to black the behavior changes also and here it will paint the black color through the luminosity of the image a bit like a Photoshop brush does if I change to another arbitrary color it does exactly the same thing it will paint the foreground color through the um, luminosity of the loaded image. Just reload that one more time. Now with the image brush you've also got this stamp option and what this will do is it will allow you to drag out a stamp like this. So change the color to black. Does the same thing. It's worth pointing out that on the procedural brush there's a couple of uh, effects you should know about. The default behavior is noise which uh, gives a noise pattern that you're familiar with. Uh, there's also cellular, which uh, is just a slightly different uh, look. And then there's dots, which is a more regular kind of pattern, as you can see here. There are a couple of other settings which can affect your brushes. Um, and this is where the real power resides. The first one I'm going to show you is this nozzle setting here. So I'll just uh, right click to set a brush size. Um, so with the nozzle selected, you get pressure sensitivity. So the harder I press, the larger and darker my stroke is. Um, and also there's an extra setting that comes with the nozzle setting, and that's this jitter. If you click on Enable Jitter, you get chaos in your strokes, which is extremely useful. Um, especially with the procedural brush, that's one of the ways you can randomize the noise that you get with those. Just below the nozzle button, there's this imaging button, and if you click that and then click in the viewport, it activates this gizmo, which will load one of your images from your preset uh, browser. So the gizmo has three controls. At the top, there's a rotate control, 
and at the right hand side there's a scale control and in the middle there's uh, this little widget that lets you sort of move it around. Now if you've got the uh, repeat setting on you don't actually need to have the image anywhere on your mesh because you can paint outside it so there are several behaviors for the image ink and I want to talk you through all of them so with the default settings if you set your color to white it will literally paint with the image as a kind of repeating texture however the darker your color gets the darker the resulting paint will be and if you set it to black on the default image ink settings you'll literally just get black paint and the image is kind of gone so if we go back to white and start painting with the image itself again. Once you start adding a tint, so if we add a tiny bit of a tint, you can see it starts to tint the resulting paint. And the stronger the tint, obviously the stronger the result is going to be. So if you go all the way to red, then it's very strong indeed. Now let me just reload that before I demonstrate the next mode. Um, you can also tick this box here that says use color as mask. and um, what that will do is it will use the luminosity of the image as a mask so let's just demonstrate that and obviously now if you paint in black you will actually get a result and obviously the same happens with the tint and you can also invert the mask so let's just do that and just paint the sort of opposite luminosity white is barely visible with this particular image but black should be pretty good and uh, you can also use a UV mask which uh, will apply um, an image so let's just load, a, let's load an image from somewhere let's grab something from here and just try one of the brushes let's try this, it'll be quite obvious so that will apply this mask over the UVs and essentially you're kind of blending the two images together you can see the, the mask is being applied and the image ink at the same time. So it's quite a versatile system, there's a lot of options. Um, you, can, uh, you can use the default setting essentially to paint a texture and uh, you can scale and rotate your texture with the gizmo or you can use the images mask to um, use it more like a Photoshop style brush but more powerful than a Photoshop style brush since it uh, can tile. The final setting I want to show on the Image Ink brush is this stamp setting. So if you click that, and uh, depending on the scale of your gizmo and whether you've got repeat on, and also the color that you've got selected, if you now click on your mesh, you see it will um, apply the texture as a tiling texture, like a stamp all across. And obviously, the bigger you have it, the uh, the bigger it uh, displays. If you press and hold the image ink button, you see there's two other options there. The first one we're going to look at is parametric ink. Now what this does is it uses various parameters to modulate the brush stroke. So here I've set it to pressure and this will work independently of the nozzle setting. And you see I've got two very different colors in my foreground and background slots. I've got a bright yellow in the foreground and a light blue in the background. So if I press lightly, I get the foreground color. And if I press hard, it doesn't go to the background color. What it does is it mixes between the foreground and the background, creating this green color. And this uh, parametric ink will work with all of the uh, nozzles. So I can use a procedural brush if I want, or um, an image brush. Let me just resize that and demonstrate it. See, if I press lightly, it's more brown. I press hard, it's more green. To demonstrate a couple of the other parameters that are available with the parametric ink, I've just made a little bulge in the slope that I've been painting on. Um, so if I first choose incidence angle, what will happen is where the geometry is facing the uh, camera, it paints with the foreground colour, and where it's facing away like it does on the edges of this slope, it paints with the background colour. Another one that I'd like to show you is altitude. Now this doesn't take into account the way the um, this hill for instance doesn't affect it. It's not to do with um, how the geometry is in relation to the camera. It's to do with the y-axis. So at the top it paints green and at the bottom it paints yellow. There's some more parameters that um, I encourage you to check out for yourself. The final ink type that's available if you click and hold the image ink button is the random ink and this is really useful for getting some variation in your colors. So if you come down to the randomizing settings here at the bottom, they default to zero so make sure that you set them to something higher than that so that you can see the effect. 
And if I uh, just drag out an airbrush, I'm going to start painting. And you see that it's varying the color. So this is a really good um, way of getting broken color into your textures and to make sure that everything isn't too regular. And of course it works in conjunction with the procedural brush and also the image brush. So you can see you can get some very nice effects with this. In the Paint tab there's a lasso tool which is essentially a selection tool which lets you uh, confine the paint within the selected area. It defaults to this rectangular shape but there's also the option of a lasso or circle or an ellipse. Now if you first activate a paint tool and try and use this uh, selection it will appear like it doesn't work and the reason for that is you need to activate this use fall off option which is off by default and as soon as you do that it will keep the paint within the selection. Now you're not limited to using um, this lasso, you can use any of the fall offs. So if I select a linear fall off, first of all let me just um, clear this, select a linear fall off and drag it down and now I activate my airbrush tool. You'll see that at the bottom it's dark and it will get fainter at the top and you can use any of the fall offs in the fall off menu in conjunction with the painting tools. There's a couple of other tools that I want to talk about. There's the line tool which basically lets you drag out a line and then depending what brush tip you've got selected will paint a stroke going down. So that was an airbrushy kind of tip. Now I'm gonna select a harder brush turn the color to white and drag out another line and you can see um, it's changed the uh, quality of the stroke according to the uh, tip I had selected. The next thing I want to show you is a blur tool so let me just drag out a brush. This is quite a subtle effect so you have to you'd have to go over the area quite a few times but it is gradually blurring it. If you want something a bit stronger the smudge tool is much more obvious in what it does. You can see it's really smearing here and then if you click and hold the blur tool it brings up a sharpen tool and that can you have to use this quite carefully because this can artifact pretty quickly but you can see it's sharpening the transitions there. I'm just going to quickly uh, paint a stroke with the image uh, brush to demonstrate the next tool and that is the clone tool. Now this works pretty much like the one in Photoshop does you have to hold down the control key to sample an area and then once you've done that you can clone that in other parts of the image and finally in the uh, tools I just want to show you the erase tool which um, will erase a transparent image back to transparency and a non-transparent image back to whatever your background color is so in the paint tab you've got a few general purpose um, tools, fills and gradients essentially so you've got a paint bucket and uh, if you look in the options under opacity and density there's a fill tolerance which um, acts more or less like the uh, bucket tolerance in Photoshop so um, if I select a color you can see I can fill a um, it's good for basically filling a blank canvas with a solid color um, let's finish thinking as a fairly large texture um, and if you click and hold the um, paint bucket you can see there's two gradients underneath there so let's have a look at these and change my color to something different so you can see what it's doing. So you've got a radial gradient and what that will do is blend between the foreground color and the background color so I'll just draw out the gradient and you can see it's done a nice radial gradient and there's also a linear gradient let's change the color to something else and that just as you'd expect will also blend between the foreground and background colors Another thing I'd like to talk about is stacking textures in the shader tree. You can essentially treat the shader tree in exactly the same way as you would the Photoshop layers palette. And what I mean by that is that you're not limited to just painting on one texture. You can have a stack of different textures and as long as they're in a transparent format like PNG, they'll behave in the same way as layers would in a Photoshop document. So to demonstrate this, I'm just going to create a couple of new images, PNG format, call the first one layer one, make sure it's in RGBA format so it's got some transparency and add a second one PNG format let's call this one layer 2 again in RGBA format now you can see them all stacked up here in the shader tree all set to diffuse color the one with the little brush icon is the active one as in the one that you're going to paint on but you can make a multiple selection and if you multiple select images you can paint on all of them at the same time and you can also change parameters for all of them at the same time so in this case it's useful for setting the correct gamma 
for all of the images. Now I'm going to go to the bottom image and uh, make sure that's selected. Select my airbrush tool, drag out uh, a brush size and I'm going to paint on the bottom image. Now if I just move up to the image above, it treats it like a separate layer, I'm just going to change my color and go to the third one, change the color again, this time a big load of color. Now if I go back to the bottom layer and I paint a stroke going underneath everything, you can see where I'm on the same layer it, you can see the color, but where I'm on the layer where there's other layers above it, the, uh, the color is hidden. Now another thing you should know is that these um, layers can have blending modes just like layers in Photoshop so if I turn Ray GL on make this really obvious I change the uh, blend mode to add you can see it changes the way that the pixels blend if I change it to subtract changes it again I'm just going to go back to normal and turn Ray GL off you've also got different blending modes on the brushes themselves so if I change the uh, blend mode to add on the brush and uh, choose this blue color you see it's going to make color lighter. Now if I change it to subtract it's going to make the color darker. So uh, basically you can see this is quite a versatile way of working and you've got a lot of flexibility once you've decided that all your that you're happy with all your layers and uh, your, your final color you can bake, bake it all down to a single texture to, uh, to get rid of all the extra images that you've got in there. So just before we move on to the project based tutorials, there's one last thing I want to talk about. Some of you may have noticed that under my painting tools I've got this uh, save image button and that's actually a custom form that I've created. Because Modo saves the images separately from the scenes, when you go to save your scene or, or if you hit Control S, you're only saving the scene and you're not saving the images. So that means in order to save the images, you either have to uh, right click and save them here in the images uh, tab, or you have to go to the file menu and do save image. So just for convenience really, I've created this form. Now it's included with the tutorial, so what you should do is locate it with the tutorial download, and if you go to system, open user configs folder and just copy it in there it's save underscore image dot cfg just copy it into your uh, user configs it will automatically get loaded every time you start modo